can do that. So tonight, welcome. My name is Joe Bell from Sanctuary Online. I'll be your host tonight. And I'm not going to spend very much time at all welcoming you and uh, giving too much instruction because we have a full deck for you tonight, a, a wonderful presentation by our very own Reverend Elder Ken Martin. And uh, before I get to Ken, I am going to quickly share my screen and give you a little bit of information. Um, for those of you that are new, we're here every Tuesday night. And so this September, we've had Zoom 201 last week, which was a help for hosts and presenters. Tonight again is Ken Martin forgetting everything you thought you knew about gender. And then at the end of the night, Ken's going to introduce next week. It's kind of a one, two, a part one and a part two of this really important topic. And he's gonna talk about September 22nd's presentation where he's gonna interview um, Toby Johnson, the uh, best-selling author of Two Spirits, A Story of Life with the Navajo. Tor uh, Cor um, Toby's life work is around <clears throat> gender. Um, finally, the end of the end of the month, um, if you haven't done it yet, uh, we are going to have our, our monthly book club where Cheryl will host a discussion around Where the Crawdads Sing, a fantastic book, and we hope a few of you are, are most of the way through that, getting ready for the end of the month. Now tonight, Ken, I know that you have a, a packed show, so I want to go ahead and get to you really quickly. Um, Ken, you have done so much work in this arena that is just a uh, Oh, how do I say it's 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 groundbreaking and the way you break down very academic topics into a very understandable way of of listening and learning so a few weeks ago Ken was on and uh, Reverend Terry Miller just remembered Ken from years ago when you offered this presentation at her church and just said it was just unforgettable. and so uh, Terry thank you for that testimony it was great that um, you, you gave that to us just as we were getting ready to tee Ken up again. So Ken, without further ado, I'm going to uh, guide you through your slides here tonight. And um, my friend and my mentor and our teacher, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you, Joby. Can, can you see me? I'm using Barb's iPad, so I'm not quite sure what I'm doing. Um, is this okay? Can you see me? Um, we can see okay. you. Mostly we can see this, this slide. Would you like to start out in gallery view or with okay. the slides, Ken? The, the slide right now is just fine. Okay. Okay. Uh, as we begin tonight, let me say first of all that part of this uh, presentation we're going to move through uh, rather quickly uh, just because of our time constraints. If we had more time, we could spend uh, that with some of these subjects. But remember that you can always go to the recording of this presentation on YouTube if you want to uh, spend a little more time with it or you can contact me if you have some specific questions that don't necessarily get answered tonight. Uh, Joby is going to be helping me with the PowerPoint presentation uh, this evening and I'm gonna try to move through the whole presentation first and then have questions and answers because I know some of you and I know you get way ahead of me if I let you start answering questions you know, before I'm done. So I'm gonna do this whole presentation and then we're gonna have some time uh, for, for questions later. So let's begin by acknowledging that gender remains one of the most confusing and misunderstood aspects of human sexuality uh, because in every society about which we know anything, gender functions on two different levels at exactly the same time. If we can have slide two, Joby. Gender has a physiological function, which manifests in biology. And what biology tells us is that we are a gender dimorphic species. That means that we are either male or female. But at the same time, gender has a psychological function, which manifests in culture. And culture tells us that there are specific roles assigned to each gender and that these roles consist of gender appropriate behaviors. So behavior that is defined I as can't masculine. Get to, um, no? I got you, Ken. Sorry, what did I hear? Um, just we're, we're asking um, some folks to, they can go ahead and mute themselves. And again, as you go along, Ken, just to make sure that they don't forget their questions, they can type those questions in the chat box. We'll gather those at the end of yes. your presentation. Yes, okay, good, thank you. So 
culture tells us that there are certain behaviors that are gender appropriate if you're a biological male and there's certain other ones that are appropriate if you are a biological female. And the way that a society deals with its cultural expectations of gender both controls what a person is supposed to be interested in and how we're supposed to dress and how we're supposed to act. So if we can just, if we can leave the, um, uh, the PowerPoint for a minute, Joby, I can see, okay, is everybody just seeing me now, Joby? They're either seeing you, Ken, or they're seeing the whole group. And what would you like them to do? Okay. I can instruct them. Okay, it, it doesn't matter to me. I just want to be sure uh, that we, as we move from slide to slide that we're, you know, that they're not seeing the, the, the former slides. Certainly. Okay. Oh, yeah. So this is what makes the whole subject of gender a spiritual issue for a lot of us, because most of us want to be every single thing that God created us to be, but we live in societies that very rigidly enforce these controls and limitations that are imposed upon us, telling us what we're supposed to be interested in, what we're supposed to be able to do, and what we can do. Because many sexual minority people, for a lot of the reasons that we're gonna talk about tonight, are gender atypical. That is that we just don't necessarily fit into these, we represent a threat to those people who are very vested in keeping this kind of gender status quo. So the proponents of this strict gender determined behavior argue that all of these things are inborn, that they are very, very natural, that it's natural for, for a biological female to have certain interests and certain abilities, and it is natural for a biological male to have other interests and abilities, but that those are different things. And this works just fine as long as everybody's um, okay to go along with that. But when we start transgressing, they get very upset. They get very upset when we ask questions like, if this is so natural to everybody, why do you have to enforce it so rigidly? And if this is natural, why aren't you willing to just let nature take its course and let people do what comes naturally to them. The truth is that a lot of those people hate nothing more than just letting nature take its course. Often it is what we want to do and what we are capable of doing that pushes us beyond the limits of these uh, boundaries of gender assigned behavior. And wholeness and justice cannot be Come, become real for either gender and as long as we are forced into behaviors that feel unnatural to us. So listen again to these words from one of our original MCC hymns. Our God is not a woman. Our God is not a man. Our God is both and neither. Our God is I who am. From all the roles that bind us, our God has set us free. What freedom does God give us? The freedom just to be. So tonight we're going to talk about the three major components of, of gender. And I have two goals that I would like for us to meet tonight. The first one is I would like for us to understand exactly what each of the three of these is and is not, so that we can talk about gender and advocate for gender justice from a position of knowledge and awareness and uh, so that, that everyone can understand what we're talking about because there's so much of language around gender, gender is confusing. And the second thing is that we will be able to understand that there is as much diversity in gender as there is in every other aspect of creation. And why shouldn't there be? And why shouldn't that diversity be honored and respected in exactly the same way that we should respect diversity everywhere else that we find it in creation? So. We're going to talk first of all about biological gender. Uh, slide four, please, Joey. Yep. 
as we look at biological gender, there are, uh, okay, next slide, you can go to the next slide. As, there are five things that determine our biological gender. When we're talking about each one of these, I want to show you exactly what it is, and then I want to tell you what can happen in each case to cause biological gender, that is whether we are male or female, to actually be in question. And this is particularly important because so many phobias and isms are based on the idea that, yes, some other things may be in question, but at least this one thing is fixed. This is immutable. You can't argue with this. We are either male or we are female. So let's get this out of the way to begin with. Slide five, please, Joe. There are five things, again, that, that determine whether we are male or female. And the first of those is chromosomes. When the human female egg and the human male sperm come together to create an offspring. The female always contributes 22 chromosomes, which determine everything else, and then one gender determining chromosome, which is the X chromosome. The male sperm also contributes 22 chromosomes, which determine everything else, and then one gender determining chromosome, which is either an X or a Y. So the typical offspring is either 44XX, which is a chromosomal female offspring, or 44XY, which is a male determining chromosome. Now, remember when Henry VIII beheaded Anne Boleyn because she couldn't give him any male children? Any idea how many divorces have happened through the ages because men thought their wives couldn't give them male heirs? It was never her, it was always him because it is always the male who determines whether the offspring will be a male or a female. Next slide, Joby. So, what can go wrong if high school biology taught us that we're either an XX female or we're an XX, an XY male? Here are some of the variations and diversities at the chromosomal level. Some people are not born XX or Y. Some people are born XO. Some people are born XXY. Some people are born XXXY. Some people are born XXXY. Some people are born XXYY. Some people are born XYY, and there's even a phenomenon known as mosaicism in which every single cell in the human body has a different combination of gender determining chromosomes. That person is not male or female. That person is literally genetically male and female. Because of the chromatin test that was developed in 1949, we are now able to test easily to find out exactly what the gender determining chromosomal makeup of any person happens to be. Slide seven, Joey. The second thing that determines our biological gender is gonads. What you see on the right side of your screen are called the homologs. This shows that at the very beginning of inception, the tissues that form what eventually become external genitalia are exactly the same in all fetuses for the first seven weeks. There is no differentiation at all. Then about the seventh week, if that Y male gender determining chromosome is present, it becomes decisive. And on the left-hand side of your screen, you can see that those tissues that begin exactly the same at the top of the screen begin to differentiate into male genitalia. If that Y is not present, then all of those tissues begin to differentiate into female genitalia. And by the bottom of the screen there, if, if that Y is present, then those gonads become external testes. And if they are not present, 
then they become internal ovaries. Next, next slide, Jeff. So what could possibly go wrong there? Well, first of all, some people are born with one ovary and one testicle. Some people are born with no gonads at all. Some people are born with two ovaries and two testicles. Some people are born with gonads that actually contain the genetic tissue of both X, Y and XX. Those are called ovotestes. Next slide. The third thing that actually affects our gender is hormones. And hormones uh, influence gender at two different times. First of all, prenatally, they are very important. And then secondarily, at, at uh, puberty, they are very important. So among those fetal prenatal hormones, if that Y male gender determining chromosome is present, then androgens will masculinize that, that fetal body into a male child. If that Y is absent, then those estrogens will then those estrogens will feminize that female body into a female child. Now, without the Y chromosome, all infants will differentiate female. This is a very important point. Throughout nature, nature will always differentiate female unless that is interrupted in some way. So without the Y chromosome interrupting that process, all of, of uh, nature will differentiate. So when we talk about mother nature, we're not just kidding. Okay, nature literally is mother. Nature literally is female, unless something interrupts that process. So next slide, Joey. So what could possibly go wrong there? Well, one of the things that can happen with these prenatal hormones is what's called the androgen insensitivity syndrome. And that is that the fetus may be an XY male, genetic male, but if there are not enough androgens, if there are not enough male hormones to masculinize this body, this is what can happen. Next slide, Joby. Uh, Joby, there's a slide missing there. Right there? There it is. Sorry. Okay, yes. My bad. This is, this is a picture of an XY genetic male infant born with this androgen insensitivity syndrome. That means this infant was intended to be a male, but there were not enough androgens or male hormones present to masculinize that child's body. And so this is what it looked like at birth. There is also another syndrome. Next slide, Toby. Called the masculinizing adrenogenital syndrome, where the child is actually an XX genital female. This is intended to be a female child, but for some reason there is a presence of too many male hormones. And so those male hormones attempt to masculinize the fetus. Next slide, Joby. On the right, you see four pictures, and these are pictures of XX genetic female infants. But when they are born, their genitalia is ambiguous because for some reason, there is the presence of too many male hormones which try to masculinize that fetal body. So let's, let's um, leave the uh, slides for just a minute, Joby, if you can take it back just to me. I'll second. Yeah. Uh, in one of the churches that I pastored, I had been there only for a few weeks. And I was talking to the music director about the choir. We were talking about the number of women and men in the choir. And um, we had a different number. He had one more woman than I had. And so we were trying to figure this out. I was just sure I was right. And so we were started to go through names. And when he got to Rocky Sandamano, I said, 
Rocky Sacramento is, is a man. And he said, no, Rocky Sacramento is a woman. And a few weeks later, Rocky came into my office and said, I don't know if I'm a woman or a man. And fortunately, there was a gender clinic in a hospital system uh, nearby. And so we, we took Rocky and Rocky uh, had the chromatin test. And we found out that Rocky Sacramento was in fact an XX genetic female. However, the doctors went back and looked at Rocky's mother's medical records and found out that one month after Rocky was born, the doctors removed a tumor from Rocky's mother's body, and it was a tumor that excreted androgens, male hormones. And so we found out that Rocky's body had been subjected to this masculinizing adrenogenital syndrome, so that Rocky was looked like one of those four pictures that we just looked at, and she literally did not know whether she was a man or a woman. Uh, the next slide there, Joby. Right, Ken. If you are familiar with uh, the history of the American Revolution, you'll recognize this name, Casimir Pulaski. Pulaski was born in Warsaw, Poland in, in 1745. Very early, he established himself as a horseman, as a fearless warrior, and as a great military strategist. So at a very early age, Pulaski came to the United States to fight in the American Revolution. Uh, George Washington made him a general in the Continental Army, gave him the title a hero of the American Revolution. He is also celebrated as the father of the American cavalry. He was killed in the Battle of Savannah in um, 1779 at the age of 34. There were rumors, even during his life, that he was actually a woman. And just about 10 years ago, some documents were found in Warsaw, Poland, written by a person who was present at his birth. And instead of writing that this child was either male or female, this person wrote, this child has debilities that will cause confusion and difficulty in living a normal life. Now, when, those, when that document was discovered, the Smithsonian Institute got very interested in this, and they got permission to exhume his body. He was buried in uh, Monterey Square in Savannah, where he was killed in the Battle of Savannah uh, in 1779 at the age of 34. Um, so they used mitochondrial DNA to confirm that this was, in fact, Pulaski's body, and then they examined the remains of his body. And their conclusion was that, in fact, Casimir Pulaski was an XX genetic female. Wow. Probably with the masculinizing adrenogenital syndrome, exactly like Rocky. Wow. Sacramento. That's amazing, Ken. You can just come back and leave the slides for a second, Joby. Sure. Oh, there you go. Now, right up until just recently, <clears throat> every time a child was born with, with gen genital ambiguity, one thing, there was just one approach to this, and it was to do surgery. All of these children, as infants, were surgically corrected, and 99% of them were surgically corrected to be females, whether they were XX or XY, just because that was the easiest thing to do surgically, was to try to create female genitalia with them. This, of course, caused all kinds of problems, because some of these people who were X, XX, it was okay because they still had estrogens in their bodies and so forth. But what if you were an XY genetic male who was reassigned at infants at birth to be a female. Then when you reached puberty, all this hormonal changes started. You started developing secondary sexual characteristics of a male. Many of these children began to reassign themselves at puberty. It was just basically, it, it has been a mess up until recently. This is how timely all of this is. 
two months ago, the Lurie Children's Clinic in Chicago, which was the center of this gender reassignment surgery, apologized for their history of doing surgery on intersex infants, and they issued a statement saying, quote, these irreversible surgeries should not be performed until patients can participate meaningfully in making decisions for themselves, close quote. Sean Wall, who's the co-founder of the Intersex Justice Project said, their apology and their decision to postpone this unnecessary yeah. surgery is a step in the right direction. So beginning right now, intersex people, people who are born with, with, with ambiguous genitals will be allowed to make this decision uh, for themselves when they are old enough uh, to make it. Uh, next slide, please, Joe. The second time that hormones become really important in terms of gender uh, uh, determination is at puberty. We all know that at puberty, estrogens and androgens flood our bodies and they trigger all of what we call the secondary sex characteristics, the secondary gender characteristics. And we know many of them. We, it's obvious women develop breasts, men develop beards, men develop body hair differently than women. Uh, genitalia matures in both. But what this shows is 16 different ways in which hormones change the person at puberty. And these include things like bone structure. The anatomy of bone structure in women and men changes uh, in arms, in legs. The anatomy of the skull and the head changes. Distribution of musculature, distribution of fat in the body. All of these things change. And this is very important in that puberty, if you're an XY male, androgens take over and they make all those changes they're supposed to make for that person on the left up there. And, and estrogens take over and make all those changes they're supposed to make. But what could possibly go wrong here? Next picture, please, Jovi. I'm starting to get the hang of <laughs> I'm starting to get the hang of this when you ask this question, Ken. What could possibly go wrong here? <laughs> Next slide. Because there's a list yes. of things. <laughs> yes. So what happens here is that an imbalance of hormones at puberty can result either in, first of all, I want you to look at the second thing there, delayed puberty. There are documented cases of people who don't go through puberty until their 30s or their 40s or even their 50s. And there are documented cases of people who never go through puberty. There are people who live into their 70s and 80s who never go through puberty. The most difficult of these particularly, uh, particular anomalies, however, is what is called premature puberty or pubertal precocity. And what this means is that those hormones kick in in infancy. On the left, you see a picture of a, a, a female child less than two years old developing breasts. On the right, you see a picture of a male child less than two years old with fully developed male genitalia, uh, a crown of pubic hair beginning. And these aren't even, these aren't the most serious of these cases. There are cases where full puberty sets in uh, in infancy and uh, it can cause uh, uh, serious mental problems lots of physiological problems in terms of a bone structure and, and so forth. So this is one of those cases which is really uh, quite sad, but just represents one more of those times when what we are told to expect happening may not happen exactly as we are told. Next slide, Joby. The fourth thing that determines whether we are male or female are our internal reproductive structures. Every fetus has rudiments of both, of both systems, female and male, in them to begin with. The female is called the Mullerian system. It consists of five things, uterus, cervix, vagina, fallopian tubes, and ovaries. Next slide, Joby. This is a cross-section of female anatomy, which shows exactly where each one of those things is located in the female body. And each of those five things has a specific responsibility and ability to create and deliver the, the egg, the ovum. Uh, next slide, Joby. 
in the male, the internal reproductive system is called the Wolfian system. It also includes five things, the prostate gland, the seminal vesicles, vas deferens, epididymides, and bulbourethral glands. Next slide. This cross section shows exactly where they are located within the male body. And each of these five things also has uh, a responsibility for developing and delivering uh, the sperm. Now, if you are an X, X female, then sometime early in your development, those Mullerian vestiges will disappear and you'll just become, have a Mullerian internal reproductive system. If you're an XY male, then sometime during your early prenatal development, then that Mullerian vestige will just disappear and you will become an XY male. Here are the atypical or, or diverse examples of what can happen here. A prenatal hormonal mix may result in the presence of people being born with both fully developed Mullerian and Wolfian systems, or people are born without either, or most often when this anomaly happens, people are born with parts of each of them. Next slide, Joby. The fifth and final thing that determines our maleness or femaleness is our external organs. And for this, we go back to those homologs. As you can see at the top of your screen, to begin with, we have exactly those same genital tissues and they remain the same for about seven weeks. After about seven weeks of gestation, if that Y male determining chromosome is present, then it takes charge and all those tissues begin to differentiate into what you see on the left, which becomes male genitalia. If they are not present, if that Y pre is not present, then that X remains dominant and those exact same tissues differentiate into female genitalia, which you see on the right. Most people don't know this, but, but we, have those, we have the exact same genital tissues. They just differentiate differently. In other words, the glands of the head of the male penis is the exact same tissue as the clitoris in the female. And the shaft of the male penis is the exact same material as the internal labia in female genitalia. And the scrotum in the male on your left, which holds the testicles, is the exact same material as the, uh, as the uh, labia majora, the larger uh, labia in the female. Now, the United Nations says that 1.7% of all infants born in the world are born with ambiguous genitals. 1.7%. That sounds high. But Dr. Jane Ray, who is an MD and PhD uh, pediatric urologist here in Austin, was a member of my church for years and years and years here. I interviewed her about this, and she said, in fact, that she felt like the incidence of children being born with, with uh, uh, genital ambiguity is even higher than 1.7%. And she said that there were studies, even though I have not seen these, that indicate that environmental changes and a lot of other things are going to contribute to even an increase in the, in the percentage of children who are born in this way. Uh, 24, Joby, next slide. You got it, Ken? So when we talked about those five things that we just talked about, we were talking only about physiological characteristics that make us male or female, or a combination of both. When we talk about gender role, which, are, which is our second topic, we move from physiological and biological to psychological and cultural. Your gender role is determined by the way you either accept or reject, the way you either obey or disobey your society's rules for what is masculine or feminine. If you can come back just to me now, Joby. If your biological gender and your gender role are in harmony, you won't feel any kind of pressure about this. However, if they are not, if you are a male who is considered feminine or a female who is considered masculine, then you may suffer everything from frustration and harassment all the way up to violence. As 
almost every sexual minority person knows. If people are male or female, according to the way they meet certain physiological criteria, then we are masculine or feminine to the extent that our interests and our abilities conform to specific cultural expectations. Dr. John Money uh, wrote this. He said, gender role equals all those things a person says or does to disclose himself or herself as having the status of a boy or man, girl or woman, respectively. It includes but is not restricted to sexuality in the sense of eroticism. A gender role is not established at birth. Remember all those things we just talked about are established at birth. But it wow. is built up cumulatively through experiences encountered and transacted, through casual and unplanned learning, through explicit instruction and inculcation. Now, there's some indications that prenatal hormones may predispose males to some behaviors and females to other behaviors. But here's how we know that gender role is really a cultural creation. It is that there is more variety within each gender than there is between the two genders. In other words, there is more variety between masculine men and feminine men and between masculine women and feminine women than there is between males and females. So from the moment you are born, gender behavior is either given a green light or a red light. If you do what your society tells you is congruent with your gender, you get a green light. If it's not, you get a red light. And many of us can remember many instances in our childhood when adults let us know very clearly that we were getting a red light instead of a green light. And it literally does begin from the moment of your birth. Expectation, think about this. Expectations for your whole life begin within seconds of your birth when they see what is between your legs. Numerous studies show that female infants are held more, longer, and differently than male infants. Male and female infants are rewarded and punished for different behaviors, literally from birth. Tom and I had a friend in California, her name was Jenny Clemens, she was a folk singer. And Jenny wrote a song, of, I, I did this presentation um, in California, and Jenny wrote a song about it. And I can't remember the verses, they were very clever, but I remember the chorus. And this is what the chorus said. It said, it's only a pee-pee and everyone's got one. It's only a pee-pee, so what's the big fuss? It's only a pee-pee and everyone's got one, there must be more important things to discuss. In one very well-known study, a group of researchers took one male infant and dressed it in pink and gave it an obvious female name. They took another infant, dressed it in blue and gave it an obvious male name, introduced it to a group of adults. Now the adults knew that this, child, that this was a, a research study, but they thought the children were being observed, observed. They didn't know they were being observed. And what was observed was that they treated those children totally differently depending on what they perceived their genders to be. And then those researchers took those same two infants, reversed their clothing, reversed their names, and introduced them to another group of adults. And those adults also treated them totally differently according to what they perceived their genders to be. For example, the researchers reported that with both groups of adults, the female identified infant cried and was given, and when she cried, she was assumed to be in distress. And so she was nurtured and she was comforted and she was reassured. But when the male identified infant cried, he was assumed to be mad. They just thought he was angry and they didn't do anything except try to calm him down. The same researchers then did a study with toddlers. And when the female toddler did something wrong, she was taken aside she was told what she did wrong. It was explained to her and she was told not to do it again. When the male toddler did the exact same thing, he was either ignored or he was told to just stop it. 
without any explanation. And what they concluded, among other things, is that this might help to explain why in adulthood, some adult females feel like it is okay to be sad, but not to be mad. And some adult males feel it is okay to be mad, but not to feel sad. Now, it doesn't take a genius to figure out that somebody is benefiting from all of this and trying to keep all of these gender stereotypes in place. The obvious misogyny that is involved here and the way traditional gender role behaviors serve patriarchal purposes is a whole different discussion for another time. That's a discussion I'd love to have too. But just to remind ourselves exactly how this works, even in the most obvious ways, does anybody here remember Margaret Mead? Did you read about Margaret Mead in your sociology class or your anthropology class? Uh, she was an amazing woman, an anthropologist, one of the first field anthropologists who went out and observed and studied and reported on people. She wrote about being in Papua New Guinea. And in Papua New Guinea, she found two villages about eight miles apart. And in these villages, weaving was very important. These were pre-literate peoples, but their baskets had to be woven, uh, their sleeping mats were woven, sometimes part of their living structures were woven. And in one of these two villages, the women did all of the weaving. And in that village, weaving was not given any status or credit at all. It was demeaned, it was not compensated. In the village eight miles away, men did all of the weaving. I don't have to finish this story, do I? You already know that in that village, weaving was the most glorious and wonderful thing that anybody could possibly do. I've been to Papua New Guinea, and I can tell you that in terms of the enforcement of those kinds of gender roles, not a whole lot has changed. Now, much more recently, a group of middle school children here and students here in the United States were asked the question, what do you call a man who works with clay? The most often given answer was a sculptor. When they asked, what do you call a woman who works with clay? The most often given answer was a kindergarten teacher. Oh, God. When they, that same group was asked, what do you call a man who cooks? The most often given answer was a chef. When asked, what do you call a woman who cooks? The most often given answer was a mother. Now, I think it's fair to say we have made a lot of progress. I know I've seen a lot of progress in my life to make it easier for both women and men to do what we are interested in and what we are capable of doing uh, regardless of our genders. However, just listen to some of the recent conversations about whether women should be elected to the highest elected political offices. Just listen to some of the most recent conversations about the role of women in the military. Or just look at the lack of representation of women in some of the highest positions of leadership in areas that have traditionally been considered male domains, like the corporate world. Or look at the disparity in salaries between women and men in professional sports. And you'll see that we still have a long way to go. So remember, biological gender is about physical attributes that make us male or female. But gender role is about interests and behaviors that society tells us are either masculine or feminine. Now, those things are based on the idea that men and women are really, really different. We have very, very different interests and we have very, very different abilities. How many different things do you think women can do that a man can't do, regardless of how hard he tries? How many things do you think a man can do that a woman can't do, regardless of how hard she tries? Next slide, Joey. There are three things that a woman can do that a man cannot do. And there is only one thing that a man can do that women cannot do. Women can menstruate, gestate, and lactate. 
and men can impregnate. <laughs> and other than that, advocating for gender justice means insisting upon the right of every person, male or female, to do what we're interested in doing and what we are capable of doing and to do it without being ridiculed or without being persecuted. Next slide, Jebby. So the third and final area that we're gonna talk about is gender identity. If biological gender consists of the physiological characteristics that make us male or female and gender role consists of the societal and cultural expressions of femininity and masculinity, gender identity is your personal perception of yourself as male or female. It is what you feel inside regardless of whether that is concordant or discordant, rather regardless of whether that fits or doesn't fit, matches or doesn't match your biological gender. If it fits, then that person is called a cisgender person. But if it does not match, then that person is called a transgender person. If we can leave the slides and just come back to me, Joby. Gender identity seems to be set at a very early age. There are a number of recent studies that show that gender identity is actually set by, by the age of acquisition of language. By the time we learn language and have to start using words like boys and girls and him and her and he and she, we begin to establish our own gender identity as either male or female. And, and these studies also show that once gender identity is set, it becomes almost irreversible for most people. You may have noticed that just in recent years, more and more young children are having their gender identity acknowledged. More and more children under the age of five are being allowed to tell us what their gender is. And they're being allowed to start transitioning at very, very early ages. And that is, is, is we believe, a very healthy thing because many of these children uh, at very early ages start to say, I'm a girl or I'm a boy, and that doesn't match their biological gender. And everybody in the world tries to change that. And now what is beginning to happen is that those, in, that those children are being listened to. So probably, as you know, research in the last few decades about um, human sexuality generally, but specifically about sexual orientation and specifically about gender identity has focused more on nature than on nurture. If you Google research on transsexuality, you will find hundreds of scientific studies that associate transsexuality with distinct brain structures. There are a number of others that emphasize prenatal hormones, like some of those we just talked about, and there's still some that argue that transsexuality has a psychological causation. None of that is conclusive yet. All of that is important because knowledge is important. But what it does do is support our conclusion that there is as much diversity in gender as there is in every other aspect of creation. For our purposes tonight, I want to emphasize one simple principle. And this may be the most important thing I say tonight. And here it is. Regarding gender identity, People are who they tell you they are. Regarding gender identity, people are who they tell you they are. In one of the churches I pastored, I had a couple of blocks of time during the week when I did individual counseling. My administrative assistant set those appointments, and so I often didn't even know who was coming until they got there. One day I had an appointment with somebody named Char Charlotte. That's all I had, just the name Charlotte. And when Charlotte came into my office, Charlotte was about six foot two, and Charlotte had a couple of days of beard stubble, and Charlotte was dressed in what appeared to be male clothing, except she was wearing a, a, a wig and had dangling earrings, and that was Charlotte. Because people are who they tell you that they are. That's the, one of the most important principles, not just for gender identity, but just about everything else we have talked about tonight. Now, 
one of the most interesting things that's happening right now is that a lot of historians are beginning to uncover a lot of history and they're realizing that transsexuality transsexuality as a lifelong identification with a gender different from your biological gender including living out all of the the uh, gender role uh, expectations that are different from your biological gender has throughout history been not only accepted but even celebrated in a lot of different cultures particularly older ones but also in some more modern ones like Native American societies, which we're gonna talk about next week, by the way, and even today in some places, which I'm gonna show you in just a minute. But then with the rise of modern technological society, it became more and more important to try to, to really emphasize these strict gender stereotypes so that any variation in the idea of gender uh, became discouraged, sometimes even violent. The Trans Murder Monitoring Project records that there have been almost 14,000 black trans women murdered in the last eight years alone. The Human Rights Commission cites racism, sexism, and transphobia, along with an unchecked access to guns as the reasons for that. And when we look at that racism and at that sexism and at that transphobia, we see an ignorance of and a lack of respect for the diversity that we are talking about here tonight, especially in human sexuality generally and specifically in gender identity. This wave of violence has become so predominant that November the 20th of every year has been designated as the International Trans Day of Remembrance to remember those who were murdered because of transphobia, trans men and trans women. Now, in Thailand, I lived in a town called Nakhon Rajasima. It was a population of about 20,000 people. It was about 200 miles northeast of Bangkok. And in the center of this town, there was a, a, a park. It was about a, a square city block, and it was called Katoi Park. Katoi is the Thai word for a female trans woman, a trans woman. And when I first noticed the people who gathered in and around that park, regardless of when you were there, I asked one of my Thai friends, what is this? And he explained to me, this is Katoi Park, and those are Katoi's. And he told me what they were. And he explained to me that these were the Katoi's, most of whom were prostitutes, and that this is where they met their Johns here in this Katoi, Katoi Park in the center of, of the town. And he told me this with absolutely no judgment whatsoever. And I noticed that these people were not harassed or bothered in any way. And in the center of this park, there was a large monument and at the top of the monument, there was a statue of an old woman. And after a few more weeks, I began to realize that people would bring flowers and candles and incense and place it at the base of this monument, that they would stop there and they would pray. And so I asked another of my Thai friends, a young Thai woman, I said, who is that? And she said, oh, that's Mamo. She said, Mamo is the, is the saint of this town. She saved this town. And then she told me this story. During the Second World War, the Japanese wanted to occupy Thailand. And so they sent about 10 uh, Japanese military officers to this town to look around and see if this might be a place where they wanted to bring and, and station soldiers. The Thais did not want the Japanese uh, in Thailand. And so Mamo was herself a Katoi and she ran a brothel, and all of the women in the brothel were also Katoys. And Sam Mamo created this plan. She held a banquet for all of these Japanese military officers and intentionally got them all very drunk. And then each of them went back to a private room with one of the Katoys, and at a specified time, Mamo rang a bell and each of the Katois pulled a knife out from under their bells 
uh, their beds and stabbed these Japanese officers to death. And Mamo and the Katois saved the city of Nakarajisima. And that is the story of Mamo and Katoi Park and the way these women are treated in that city. But it's not just in that city. Uh, next slide, please. So we're going to go back to the slides now, Ken. There you go. Yes, we're going back to the Thai trans women. There you go. In Thailand today, Katoi's trans women are highly respected and admired. The woman you see on the right is Patawiran Tanaki. And in 2015, she won the Miss Mimosa Queen pageant, which is Thailand's pageant for the most beautiful trans woman. And that, by the way, that pageant is televised nationally. The woman you see in the center is Jarat Shayashir Mongkol Nawin. And just last year, 2019, she represented Thailand in the Miss International Queen pageant and won that pageant as the world's most beautiful trans woman. The woman you see on the left is Trishada Poid Picharat. She's a well-known trans actress in Thailand, and she was also named by US Film Magazine as one of the 10 most beautiful women in the world. Wow. The Philippines is also well known for its beautiful lady boys. Next slide, Joby. This is a beautiful lady boy who attended one of the worship services that I conducted at our MCC church in Quezon City uh, in, in uh, the Philippines. Next slide. These are the Zapotec Mushes. This is a fascinating story. There is a town in Southern Mexico, which anthropologists consider culturally unique. In other words, this particular culture does not exist anywhere else in the world, except in this one town. And here's why. In this town, it is estimated that one out of every 10 male who are born become Mushes. They become trans women, one out of 10. The Mushes are celebrated, they are honored, they are admired. Every year there is a week long festival celebrating them. There are parades and parties, people bring them gifts and money. Families could not be prouder than to have one of their male children become a Mushe. And anthropologists believe that this is a holdover in part from the Zapotec culture, the pre-Columbian times, when uh, like many Native American cultures we'll look at next week, were ac actually honored these people as a third gender and as a holy people. And among North American Native peoples, they were considered shamans and, and holy people, dream interpreters and foreseers and, and honored for spiritual reasons. But let me tell you why these are honored. This is, a, this is unique for this reason. The holdover from the Zapotec culture is that they are honored because they are mushes or trans women. But this area is still infused with Catholic theology. And one of the things they appropriated from Catholic theology is that young women must be virgins at birth. I mean, at marriage. And so these women, the Mushes, they don't have a spiritual role, they have a sexual role. The Mushes, the Zopatek Mushes, their primary role in this culture is to introduce young men to sex. Young men learn sex from these Mushes before they are married because they must all marry virgins. Next slide. Wow. I mean, this is fascinating, Ken. When I was in Pakistan, I worked with this group of trans women uh, for several weeks. These are all trans women, and the pictures they are holding are pictures of themselves in their outfits as wedding dancers. Now, you 
saw those beautiful women from Thailand earlier. In Thailand, hormones and surgery are readily available. You can imagine that in Pakistan, they are not. And so these are trans women with no access to hormones, no access to surgery. The one thing they can do other than many of them are prostitutes and that's the way they make money. But the only other way they can make money is as wedding dancers. And what that means is that each of them has a, a dress, a costume like you see there, and they dress up as women and they are hired to dance at weddings. And they dance as women in these weddings and they are paid to do that. Now, when I heard that, you can go ahead and move to the next slide, Joby. When I heard that, I heard them telling me that the man to my immediate left in this picture is Pastor Bhutajani. He was a Methodist minister that I was working with there, and he was my translator. When I heard that, it didn't seem to fit with everything else because everything else I was told was that these people live in danger all the time, that they are persecuted, that they are, uh, that they are attacked, that um, you know that that, that that there's horrible prejudices against them. When I asked about that, Abutajani asked, and they told him that even though they are paid to dress up and dance in these weddings, which gives them great pride and the sense of being able to be who they really are, that at the end of the wedding, children are allowed to mock them and call them names and run them away throwing things at them, food and other things at them. So they're humiliated at the end of this experience, but at least they get to dance and dress up and be themselves for that very brief period of time. About two months after I was there, uh, all of them, by the way, live in one room and it has a mud floor and it only has a tin ceiling that covers half of the room and they all cook on one tiny little burner and they're, they're, they're really poverty stricken. But about two months after I was there, one, a group of men broke into their little room and beat them up and one of them was killed. And, and I was never able to find out which one, but one of the people that you see in this picture uh, was beaten to death just about two months after um, this picture was taken. Now, I show you all of those things simply to say that in different times and in different places, trans people have been treated in very different ways. So final slide, Joby. Tonight, we've tried to look at three aspects of gender, biological gender, gender role, and gender identity. And I started with two different goals. The first goal was that we would learn the differences between these two things and understand what happens when people confuse these things so that we would be able to advocate for gender justice in intelligent, informed ways. And the second thing was that we would accept the diversity that exists in gender just like it exists in every other aspect of creation and that we would learn to respect it in gender in the same way it should be respected in all uh, other aspects of creation. And I hope that we've been able to at least uh, touch on those things um, tonight. I want to just briefly tell you this and then I want to answer any questions that you may have. Next week we have a follow-up uh, to this. I'm going to be interviewing uh, Toby Johnson. Toby is an acclaimed and award-winning author. He's published a number of books that explore the intersectionality of sexuality and spirituality and mythology and mysticism. We're going to be looking particularly next week uh, at, at his life and his work, but at his, his historical novel entitled Two Spirits, A Story of Life Among the Navajo. It is, a, it is a story about spiritual wisdom and love and gender diversity, and also about the subjugation of Native American peoples. And so I hope you'll join me next week 
as we kind of conclude this um, emphasis on gender with that um, interview. And uh, I'm right on time for where I hope to be. And so now do we have any questions, Joby, that I might be able to answer? <laughs> Do we have any questions? I've got like 40, Ken, but I mean, it's not my night, right? <laughs> um, I'm going to actually reach out to Barb. As you were keeping me a little busy going back and forth with the slides, I wanted to make sure I had the right ones on. Barb, <laughs> I'm not sure if you can see any um, questions in the chat. And if you can't, then we'll go the old fashioned way and we'll be able to just open up if someone would raise their hand. I'll try and see you, call on you. You can unmute yourself and ask and well, the, directly to Ken. The, Go the, ahead, Barb. The, the, the chat's been active, but it's not been questions. Right. So, um, yeah, uh, before the question period, let me just put in a, a, one more plug. I've been trying to chat with all of the lead participants, um, and I have five of you on here, but if you are lead and have not specifically told me in the private chat that you're lead, um, if you would take just a second and do that now and make sure that I've got you on there. If, if you've already sent me that, then, I, then I've got you. I've got five of you. So Thank I'm going to allow Barb to run that. And anybody else, anybody have a question for Ken after uh, the presentation tonight? Go ahead and just raise your hand up. I'll try and see you and ask you to unmute and then ask Ken a question directly. If, if uh, Kathy, thanks so much. If you will go ahead and unmute like you have, thank you, and go ahead and ask Ken your question directly. Oh, mine's more for you. I want to hear some of your questions because usually they're pretty insightful. <laughs> <laughs> mm. You're asking me or you're asking Ken? I'm asking you to ask Ken a couple of your 40 questions. Oh, my goodness. I'm still oh. digesting so much of this. There was a lot of information. It was amazing. It was amazing. It was a lot of information, fabulous information. This is where actually Kathy is the host. I defer to Jordan. And Jordan, I always ask you to take us off. You've always got great <laughs> questions. <laughs> yeah. Love. There you go. I, Thanks, Jordy. Yeah, so thank you so much, um, uh, Uncle Ken. Uh, wow, that was a tour de force and um, really <laughs> timely, you know, uh, thinking about social justice and being advocates. Uh, uh, I, I really appreciate, first off, you giving voice to the, the, to the triumphs and the celebration of uh, trans history. Uh, you know, in the pre-Columbian world, you gave an example of the Navajo and then also the Zapotec in Oaxaca, talking mm -hmm. about Papua New Guinea. So I think that's a really important statement you make that we really need to do the research and flip the narrative, right? And, and tell the stories of yes. the, of yes. the and, and my question uh, would be, how do we, uh, you know, maybe, maybe this is one aspect is telling the narrative of trans people, but how are we uh, advocates for trans justice? Because I mean, trans justice, that sounds like a really important uh, theme, especially now with all these intersectionalities of, of Black Lives Matter and, and representation. Right. So how are we to be advocates for trans justice? Yes, yes, that's an excellent question. And, and uh, one of the first ways, of course, is to align ourselves with these organizations that are out there, you know, uh, striving for uh, legislation, policy changes, uh, you know, all of the ways that we can make uh, the lives of trans people uh, e easier. Uh, one, of the, one of the other things I think that's very important for us um, who care about things like this is to is to do the do some of the research, do some of the reading. Uh, you know, uh, where did all of this animosity and hostility and violence come from? Uh, you know, and why why in Thailand is it okay for trans women to walk down the street and be admired? And even in the Philippines, which is a very Catholic country. You know, uh, they're, they're very conservative people, you know, may still, uh, you know, condemn these beautiful lady boys. But I spent a lot of time in the Philippines. And every time I saw a beautiful lady boy walk down the street, I saw people smile and nod. 
You know, they admire these people for for their beauty and 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 for you know this persona that they create about themselves. And one of the things that um, I I lectured at a seminary in the Philippines, uh, Un uh, Union Theological Seminary, uh, which is a seminary that is. Uh, jointly affiliated with the United Church of Christ and the United Methodist Church. And I lectured there about something different, uh, sexuality and spirituality, something different from gender. But I asked a woman there um, who is who teaches gender studies, um, I asked her, what, how, do, how do you explain this? You know, for example, I was in a mall in Manila one of the biggest malls in Manila, and there was a huge gathering space, like an auditorium space at the bottom of the mall. I happened to be there on Hollywood, I mean on uh, Hollywood, on Halloween. And there was a big sign that said there's a, a Halloween costume uh, contest at a certain time. And there was a big stage in one way. And I thought that'd be interesting. And so I went back at that time and there may have been a couple of people in costume but the other 30 or 40 people were young males dressed as females. They, they clearly were lady boys. And there were hundreds of people gathered there. And they clapped and applauded and cheered them. And so I asked um, uh, this, this woman professor at Union Theological Seminary to what do you attribute this? And this answer is fascinating, and it informs the question of what do we need to know to be able to argue against violence and prejudice and so forth. This is what she told me. She said, among the indigenous peoples of the Philippines, before we became colonized, our deities were female. God was feminine in the Philippines. And the feminine God and the idea of the feminine divine was called Babayan, Babayan. And so she said, within our DNA, there is this respect for femininity and the divine feminine. And so she said, when, when the Spanish came here and colonized us and brought Catholicism here, she said, yeah, we like Jesus, but we loved Mary. <laughs> they identified with Mary even more than Jesus because they had this history of the divine feminine. And it was her opinion that all of that actually carried over into this present day respect for femininity you know, wherever it was displayed. So I think there are two different things here, Jordan. One of the things is we need to inform ourselves about all of these things. Like for example, in Thailand, why, why is the Thai trans women's beauty pageant televised nationally? You know, that doesn't happen here. You know, that doesn't happen in many places. But here's why, because in Buddhism, Buddhists teach that the katoi, the, the, the trans woman is a katoi because of transgression she committed in a previous life. It's all about karma. In other words, this is her karmic, this is her karmic life as a result of something she did in the past. And that relieves her of any choice. That relieves her of any responsibility. And so she didn't have any choice here. That's just karma. And so it's okay to admire them and respect them and honor and celebrate them most many some some very conservative buddhists would still condemn them or pity them but but the popular attitude in thailand is why would you not look at these beautiful beautiful people you know and celebrate them so first of all it is informing ourselves you know about where these traditions come from and and how they are biologically uh, who they are, and 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 then aligning ourselves with organizations and causes and policies that support the the, the rights of trans people, and that's a very easy thing to find out about uh, in our culture today. Thanks, Ken, and thanks, Jordan. Great question as usual. I want to I want to address one thing, and we're going to keep on going. Um, Pam, you've got a question next. Um, 
normally what happens is we publish, uh, normally on my Facebook page, we publish the recording of each week and also, and that's a, it's a public recording, um, so everybody can have access to that, whether you're friends with me or not. Secondarily, we send off an email normally to everyone, and um, we would normally add a, a great slide deck like this just straight to the email, Ken, but we're a little um, being thoughtful regarding the adult content. Right. And so what right, we'd right. like to do tonight, folks, is just make sure if you'd like access to the recording, that will come to you in a link via an email that Barb sends out. It comes, it'll come from talk to us at Sanctuary in the Woods. Um, so if, if we don't have your email, please put it in the chat box. If we do have your email, we're gonna send out an email just to the people on this session tonight, okay? That email will have the slides attached to it. And then we are gonna just trust you to hold them and honor them and be careful with them. Nothing copyrighted, Ken, just be careful with their content. Is that fair? Yes. So Ken, that right. covers you. Barb, do you think that covers what your concern is for, for us? Silence. Yes, I think that's fine. No, <laughs> no, I think that works. Okay. <laughs> I Thank was just you. checking to make sure if I'm on if I'm on mute or not. <laughs> so you're great. And then Pam, you've got a question. Would you unmute yourself and go ask Ken directly? Well, I, I have a, oh, I am unmuted. I have a two part question. Um, I have a hypothesis, and I was wondering if you think it's possible. I've noticed the younger generation, especially like my teenagers that I have that they're more in touch with not only their gender fluidity, but also their sexual fluidity, that maybe in time, it's an evolution of humanity. Is that possible? That's my first question. And my second one is, some of us are sitting here wondering what our XY type is. Is that something that can be tested? And if so, where? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Good questions. Uh, the answer to your first question is yes. Um, I, th something is happening uh, in our culture right now. And um, I know that it's not universal among all younger people, but there clearly is a generation of people coming along right now who um, are so much more comfortable both with their gender and their sexuality, Pam, as you indicated. And again, those are two different things. They're, they are much more gender fluid in that when I was growing up, there were prescriptions about what we did say what we, and didn't say, what we did wear and didn't wear, certain actions that were, were prohibited for, for males, you know, or we would be called sissies and girly and all that kind of thing. And I observe this, I have, uh, I have a grandson who is 23 years old, and I have a granddaughter who's 21 years old. And um, among them and their friends, some of whom have been in our home, and, and others, I do observe this gender fluidity, which is a relaxation around those, what we were talking about is those prescribed gender roles. Yeah. They are much more comfortable and to me, it feels really healthy uh, in the sense that they are more able to express themselves um, um, emotionally. You know, I consider myself a person who grew up basically emotionally retarded, you know, because I was, I, I was always afraid I was going to say something or do something that might tip it off you know, that I wasn't who people thought I, I was. And so I lived literally in fear of that and really trying to live by those prescribed gender behaviors. And so there clearly is a generation coming up right now, much more gender fluid. They're also much more, much more fluid in terms of their sexuality. Um, you, you know, I, when, when I was uh, a teenager and in my 20s and 30s, People were very clear, I am gay, I am straight, I am bi, and believe me, most everybody said straight. Now, those, those labels just don't mean the same thing. And um, I, I don't understand this, you know, um, uh, 
I can't understand it uh, because I grew up when I did and the way I did, but it's clear to me that it's real. Uh, this is real. Uh, there are young people today who are growing up much more comfortable with their sexuality and letting it express itself not so much being directed toward one gender or the other, but in terms of who is important in their life and how they might want to express that, um, you know, sexually or erotically. So I, I, I totally agree with you, Pam. First of all, yes, that is happening. That is happening clearly. It looks to me like it is very, very healthy. I have not seen anything to indicate that it's not a healthier way of being in the world than I was, you know, at their age. The, your second question is wondering about your uh, chromosomal um, gender. Um, almost every major city now that has a hospital has a gender clinic. And every gender clinic can do a chromatin test. It's a very simple test now. And uh, you can just go and tell them that you're interested in knowing what your chromosomal gender, chromosomal makeup is. And they will, they just do a little test and it'll cost you a few bucks. And they'll tell you, you're either an XX female or you're an XY male, or you are one of those variations that I showed you there. Some of those variations are very rare. Mosaicism, for example, the one I told you about where every cell in the body has a different uh, gender determining chromosome. But some of them are not that different. Like, for example, the XXY, which is known as the Kleinfelter's syndrome, that is the most common of all of those. Sexual and it is, it is, in fact, uh, where a person has two female gender determining chromosomes and one male gender determining chromosome. And so you might be surprised, you know, you may find out something about yourself you don't know, but just try to find a gender clinic and ask for a chromatin test. And that's how you can find that out. Being a mosaic, do you want to study us? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, definitely. I don't like the idea of my daughter thinking she's more evolved than me, my teenager. This is a scary thing. <laughs> well, or, or Pam, we can be thankful that they're all more involved. The youngsters are more involved than we are, right? Just by, um, yeah. just by the opportunity to learn and grow and become more conscious. And even hopefully, as Jordan was saying, with all the unrest, to learn that each of us has such a learning curve, right? Right now to how to be a better human, you know, and a more conscious and just a more educated human. I can I love the, the fact that you talk about ignorance, you know, ignorance untended becomes bigotry. And that's, that's where things get tough is when we actually hold a value rather than yes. have an ignorance. And, and most often yes. those ignorances are just because we don't know yet what we know. And I'll speak with I statements right here during the Black Lives Matter work. Um, just starting to read books, just starting to talk to my friends, the awareness of my ignorance, you know, was, 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 was hurtful to my own self, my own identity. And so the beautiful thing was, okay, then Joe, do the work, get to work, learn, you know, and, and the wonderful thing we did here, for many of you who attended a few of our sessions is we, we tried to make this a space that, that you would learn something that your thinking, your current thinking would be challenged, but it would be challenged in a safe and grace-filled space. You know, you could be wrong here. You could fail. You could use the wrong language. We had folks in the chat box say, I didn't know that all lives mattered was offensive, but I learned that tonight and it felt safe to learn why, you know? So that's exactly what we're trying to do with Sanctuary Online. And tonight, Ken, man, you have get, you. My, my head is ready to explode with what I've learned tonight. And I live with you for <laughs> so, so, so just a fantastic presentation. There is one comment, um, a couple of comments. One person, Ken, is asking if there are any resources that you might offer people. Um, and we can do that one or two ways. There might be a couple things off the top of your head that we can type into the chat box here. Um, and or you could make me work and we could make a second one more slide for folks 
and attach that to the email that will probably go out, you know, Thursday or Friday. What do you think? Yeah, I think the easiest thing to do as far as to do a little, th this is so vast. I mean, literally, if you Google any of the topics that I've talked about tonight, you're going to find hundreds, even thousands of sophisticated scientific studies, you know, of all of this. There isn't any, there isn't a lot of, I tried to make this presentation tonight kind of populist in the sense of not talking about a lot of scientific stuff and so forth, just so that, that we can understand it, so that I can understand it. Uh, so it would be easier probably for us to do some research and try to find some, some uh, resources that are easier to understand than just those scientific things that I've had to plow my way through, you know, in order to get to where I am. Or maybe Joby and I, you and I need to write a book. Um, well, let's write another gender. book then. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> One thing I think we could also do, and here's your tease. If you come back next week, we could also have a slide developed by then, Ken. Would that be? That seems a little fair. Right. Yes. And yes. maybe a little bit of a tease yeah. there to, uh, to bring you back for part two. Um, I do want to lift up, you know, the thing I think I took away from this tonight, Ken, and Eric, you're saying this. You remember years ago in the 80s when, Ken, you had a question. You had some confusion as to someone who was dressed as the, as the opposite sex of who they appeared to be. And you asked Ken, and he said, you are who you tell me you are. Want to speak to that for just a minute, my friend? We can close with that fabulous story. You want to unmute Eric and just share? No, there's another question too after that. Okay, thanks, Barb. No, it, was, a, um, it was in the early 80s. There, there was a, a person who was, to me, obviously a woman who um, had breasts, but dressed strictly as a man. Men's clothes, pants, shoes, very short hair. And I don't think she, she never said I'm a man or anything, it's just her appearance. And I was asking Ken about that. And Ken goes, you are who you tell me you are. No matter what you see mm -hmm. here, that's who you identify with. And it doesn't matter what you see it's who that person tells you you are, yeah. who they are. Mm -hmm. Well, and I appreciate that, Eric. You said this person, obviously, yet it was only obvious to you, right? Well, it was <clears> you were making that challenge. Because she did have breasts. She did, you know, it was things that in the visual was a, the appearance. I mean, this is in the 80s. And, and you know, I just, <laughs> I had only been out of the closet maybe less than five years. And that was <laughs> This is before Jerry, Ken, Ken and Tom know Jerry really yep. well. But, yep. uh, you know, it was. Yeah, well, I appreciate that. that. As, as you've said, Ken's changings down through the ages can just be, again, clear and crisp and can make all the difference for us, right? Right? Yep. Uh, Tony and Leanne, you have what, our final question tonight. How lucky are you? Final question. <laughs> so go ahead and unmute yourselves and speak directly to Ken. Very lucky, I'm very lucky. Ken, um, this mm. was wonderful. And I'll try to make this quick and maybe we'll have to carry it over for next week. But I wanted to know, it was so interesting when you said that gender identity is sometimes, or most studies are showing that it's very early on when you first start language. Have there been any studies on what causes that? What What is it within us that has creates a different gender identity from our biological identity. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's that's thank you, Tony and Leanne. I love both of you so much, and I'm so glad to see that you're okay. They, uh, yes. like me, had a bout with COVID, and we we've been around with this. <laughs> um, yes. But uh, <laughs> yes, that the the causes the causes are where we go back to those scientific studies and they are becoming very important and they have to do with different aspects of brain structure and hormonal influences and, and, and so forth, you know, and, and they are inconclusive at this point, as okay. I said, but a lot of knowledge is being gained. And I really believe probably in my lifetime, you know, there is going to be some final answer, you know, to this that says uh -huh. this is what predisposes 
this gender identity, you know, instead of the other one. And that's why I said right now, for our purposes, we need to be talking about understanding and tolerance and diversity and, and, and compassion and justice, even though we can't say why. You know, we can right. say it doesn't matter why. What right. matters is that we treat each other, you know, with the respect, you know, that, that we deserve. And, and I do follow all that scientific research, and I do hope, you know, that it won't be long before we'll have some kind of definitive answer. The, the, the specific thing about language acquisition, though, is really fascinating to me because it's the idea that what's already inside a child begins to come out when they understand words like boy, girl, he, she, him, her. And if you have a, a biologically male body, but you're uncomfortable calling yourself a boy. For example, I know we're out of time here, but you, you know this ch uh, Shiloh, this child of, of uh, yes. Angela Jolie and Brad Pitt, yeah. you know, born yes. an ex female. And at age three, Shiloh started saying, I'm a boy. I'm a boy. My name is John. I'm a boy. You know, and so now Shiloh is 14, dresses totally as a boy. And there are even reports that, that hormonal uh, therapy has been started to decrease the estrogens in that body. You know, uh, but, but beginning at age three, Angelina Jolie says at age three, as soon as Shiloh could talk and say boy and girl, Shiloh said, I'm not a girl, I'm a boy. Yeah. Wow. You know, and so that acquisition of language of having to distinguish between genders that sort of brings what's already inside of you out, you know, at that right. point. Wow, well, thank you, thank you. Well, I am sure we could ask question after question after question. And I am sure that next week is going to be amazing. And I'm sure that the week after that is going to be amazing. So please don't forget um, Where the Crawdads Sing. You still have two full weeks to read that amazing book. And then on the 29th, a Tuesday the 29th, the last week of the month, Cheryl will host a phenomenal book club. We want you to bring your ideas that week also for October's book club selection. So that's for the end of the end of the month. And then next week, as Ken said, you'll be interviewing Toby. Again, a fascinating night. We will have a slide full of resources by next Tuesday night. But right now, the most important thing I can ask each and every one of you is to unmute yourselves and give Ken some loud sanctuary online live <laughs> love. <laughs> Thank you so much. Fantastic, Ken. Thank you so much, everyone. You can stay in chat or you can take off. Man, thank you so much, Ken. What an amazing night.